is to talk about multi armed bandit and we have moved away from 1974 and 1988 and we are going to talk about Lai and Robbins. Nineteen eighty-five. Okay. So, what is the setting? So I have n arms as usual, uh, <coughs> and at every point of time, I pull an arm. I get a reward, which is independent of the past rewards that I have seen. So. At time t, pull arm jt, get reward xjtt, independent of the past, independent of the past. Okay, so that's the first feature. The second feature is unknown distribution. So I don't quite know what the underlying distribution is. So that makes it a reinforcement learning problem. <coughs> okay. So let's make it a concrete problem. I came to the city of Columbus in 2015 and I needed to figure out where should I buy my groceries from. And I found that there are three grocery stores, Giant Eagle, Kroger and Whole Foods. Okay? And, and I had a complex uh, reward structure so I would of course pay a certain amount of money to buy the groceries but I want the best uh, vegetables, best fruits. Um, which shouldn't go bad very quickly in the refrigerator and things like that. Okay, so it's a very complex reward. Uh, and I wanted to figure out, and I didn't know which one is the best. I didn't know whether I should go to Whole Foods or whether I should go to Kroger or whether I should go to Giant Eagle. So what should I do? What would you do? What did you do when you, come to, when you came to Columbus for the first time? How did you figure out from where to buy groceries from? Ask of my friends. Ask your friend, okay. Try each one for five times. Try what? <laughs> try each one five times. Oh, tried each of them five times. Okay, so that's a good strategy. Um, <laughs> I always get an answer that I'm not looking for. So you asked a friend, okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Okay, so you tried each of them for, the, for five times. So you went to Kroger for five times, you went to Giant Eagle for five times, you went to Whole Foods for five times. And then at the end of the 15th time step, you made a decision that you perhaps should go to Kroger all the time. Okay, so that's my strategy now. Uh, okay. So, strategy one. Go to, so pull each arm, arm a certain number of times, and then make a decision. Okay? All right. What else? What else can you do? How else you will figure out which gym to go to, which places to shop from, what clothes to buy, I mean which store to go to buy clothes, or uh, what advertisements to put up on your website and things like that. 
what 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 other strategies can you try okay so once again for those of you who came late uh, the problem we are discussing is you came to columbus and you have three grocery stores kroger giant eagle and whole foods and the strategy and we want to come up with a strategy to figure out which one to which grocery store to go to yeah well uh, we can start arbitrarily with uh, one of the options and if we have have some minimum return threshold right. well, that we just keep pulling that arm and it's continuously above that threshold right. then we don't need to take the risk on the other arms and okay. we decide on the one that's known and we have the most data about all right so another strategy is <coughs> if one arm uh, is better than some threshold then continue picking that arm okay so some threshold based strategy if 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 one arm is giving you a reward which is above certain threshold then you always pick that particular arm and don't take any risk of uh, exploring other arms that may be better may be worse we don't know okay so because the distribution here is unknown we somehow need a metric to understand whether the strategy we are employing is good or bad okay so we have come up with two strategies here perhaps you have some other strategy that you don't want to share it's your top secret strategy of exploration uh but the question is how do we measure which strategy is better and which one is bad okay so one way to measure uh the strategy is to use what is known as regret so regret of a strategy so this is reward if i had known if i had known the unknown so in this case the unknown is the distribution of the underlying reward structure reward uh, variable minus reward achieved through the strategy so i should write here optimal reward optimal reward if i had known the unknown so if i had known the distribution i would have picked a specific arm all the time and that would be optimal but because i don't know the distribution i am picking a strategy and i'm going to look at the reward that is achieved through the that particular strategy and we would like to find a policy we would like to find a strategy that minimizes the regret as much as possible okay so that's the eventual goal we want to minimize regret Yeah. So this approach by Lyon Robbins is it uh, a restless bandit or is it uh, static bandits? Uh this is you can view it as a restless bandit but the distribution is constant across time so it doesn't depend on there is no concept of resting or a passive or active action here. Okay so you pull an arm you get a reward you pull an another arm you get the reward which is independent of all the past rewards. the idea of resting and restless came because there was a state which influenced the reward but in this case there is no state which influences the reward okay so you can think of state as a single point set in this case okay <clears throat> so let's make everything formal so we have n arms uh let me 
write the mean as m1 to, well, let me follow the notation of uh, Lyon Robbins. So theta is the parameter space of the distribution. So the, the, dist, the n arms have theta 1, theta 2, theta n, these are the parameters of the distribution of the n arms. And it all belongs to the set capital theta. So the distribution function is f of x theta. This is the PDF. This is the PDF. And the probability of x in A is given by integral of A fx theta d nu x. Nu is some underlying measure on the space. Doesn't matter what the measure is. Okay, let's say the mean is given by m theta and this is equal to integral fx theta <coughs> d nu x. The reward. Or reward. The reward that you get from a specific arm. Okay. So let's say my distribution functions are all Gaussian. Theta, which is the unknown uh, parameter of the distribution, theta is, uh, let's say, the mean of the Gaussian distribution, but it could be mean and covariance of the distribution, but. Uh, uh, so, so it could be multi-dimensional parameter space or it could be single dimensional parameter space. So a single dimension mean means that uh, you, don't, you, you don't know the mean but you know the variance. Uh, the multi-dimensional case could be that you don't know the mean and you don't know the variance either. Okay? So that's, that encompasses this, uh, our, this abstract set theta which is the parameter space for the distribution. Uh, you could have the parameter space theta equals to 0, 1, closed interval 0, 1. Uh, so all the means, all the Gaussian distributions with mean between 0 and 1. Okay? So that parameter space uh, basically encompasses everything that is unknown about the distribution. So you don't quite know these values theta 1 all the way to theta n when you start your multi-arm banded process. We assume that each distribution has some density with respect to a measure nu, base measure nu. Uh, it's kind of needed to get the lower bound. Uh, we'll get to it in a bit. And this is of course the probability distribution. This is the mean uh, when you have parameter theta. Okay. What else do we need? So we need to define m star which is the max of m theta j, max over all j. And I'm going to define delta j is equal to m theta j minus m star. No, m star minus m theta j.
okay and i'm going to have another function called tj capital t which is the summation t equals to 1 to capital t the indicator function of jt equals to uh, let me write it as ti jt equals to i so jt is the arm that has been pulled so this is the number of times arm i was pulled until time t Any questions so far with uh, the definition? Capital T is the current time index. And this TIT is number of times you have pulled arm um, I until time T, until time capital T. OK. OK. Uh, now, we want to compute the regret of a strategy, OK? So what's the optimal reward if I had known the unknown? So if I had known these parameters, what would I do all the time? If I knew which store is the best for myself, or which grocery store is best for myself, what would I do? Go to that grocery store all the time, right? So what would my reward be? Reward if I had known theta 1 to theta n. Uh, reward at time t. Reward at time capital T. So this would be uh, t multiplied by m star, right? So at every point of time, I'm going to go to the store that gives me the best value. And I'm going to get the total expected reward as tm star. So this is expected reward. Expected reward at time t if I had known theta 1 to theta n. What is the expected reward uh, with policy policy mu? This is the summation expected value of sum t equals one to capital T x j t t. Can I simplify it? So xjt is the reward that I get at time t when I pull arm jt. OK, so jt is induced from the policy mu that I have. So let's try to simplify this. This is expected value of summation x i i equals 1 to n summation t equals 1 to capital T indicator j t equals to i which is summation i equals 1 to n expected value of mi multiplied by 
expected value of T i capital T. This M i is the, oh yeah, M i is the M theta i. M i is M theta i. Okay, so all of you agree with this expression? So the amount of uh, a reward that I have received so far is the mean reward of each arm multiplied by the expected number of times I have pulled that arm until now. Okay, and the reason why I can do this is because this is IID, so I can everything becomes very straightforward if everything is IID, all the underlying random variables are IID. Okay. So what's the regret at time t under policy mu? So this is expected reward if I had known the unknowns minus the expected reward because I don't know the unknown. So what I have is summation i equals 1 to n m star minus m i expected value of T i capital T. What is the expected value of T i T? So expected value of T i T, T i T is the number of times I have picked arm i until time t. So this is just the expected value of that value. Uh, so based on your strategy, so you have multiple strategies, right? So you have uh, a strategy which says I'm going to pull us each arm a certain number of times. Another strategy would be that I'm going to pick an arm with above certain threshold and things like that. So each strategy that you pick is going to induce a certain number, uh, a random variable TIT, which says how many times you have picked that arm i until time t, depending upon all the information that you have seen so far. So this expected value is basically give, telling you how much that is. Yeah. But that still doesn't tell us anything about what m star is because it's unknown. Not so far, not at this point of time. Okay. It doesn't tell you anything about what m star is, but it does give you uh, an expression. It, it is useful in the expression for regret because the regret is given by this multiplied by the expected number of time you have pulled arm i. So if, uh, if you want to minimize the regret, what would you want to do? So this is something you cannot control. This is the thing that you can control. Um, so you can pick whether you want to go to Kroger or Whole Foods or Giant Eagle depending on the information you have received so far. So the idea is you go to the place which is best for you more often than you go to the place that is not best for you. Okay? So you want TIT, so we want, where should I write it? Okay, I am going to write it uh, here. So to minimize regret, we want to pick policy mu that picks the optimal arm more often with high probability. Okay? 
So that would minimize your regret. <coughs> yeah. Oh yeah, this 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 expression. Okay, so what's the expectation of XIT? So these are IID random variables, so therefore it would be MI. Uh, and then I have summation T equals one to capital T. Uh, so what is summation T equals one to capital T indicator function of JT equals to I? That's exactly equal to TIT. So you have expectation of XIT multiplied by expectation of TIT. Yeah, you can decouple. There is some conditioning argument here, but you can use that conditioning argument to decouple. It's similar to the Wald's identity that you have proven earlier. Okay. Yes. It would go to infinity under the optimal policy, but it would go to infinity at a much slower pace than. So ST is going to infinity. We, must consider finite, right? uh, we will consider both finite and asymptotic limit. So Lie and Robin's paper is about asymptotics. Lie and Robin paper is about T going to infinity, capital T going to infinity. Okay. So we'll look at asymptotics. So in 1985, if you were doing machine learning or reinforcement learning or statistics, you were interested in what happens as T goes to infinity. Okay, it's only very recent, you know, 20, 2005 onwards when people have started looking into finite time bounds. So if we're solely looking at the asymptotics of that, that gets rid of any discussion about uh, an exploration budget for how much penalty we're willing to pay for exploring all the other states. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, we will look into it in a bit. Okay. Uh, what else that I wanted to cover? Okay, that's it. Okay, so this is the expression for regret. And uh, let's try to compute the regret for some of the simple strategies that was uh, given to us earlier, like somebody mentioned it in the class. I'm going to erase this side of the board, so I'm hoping everyone has written this down. Just wanted to remind you, this is exactly equal to delta i. Okay, so let's say my policy is uh, oh yeah, I, I forgot adding another thing which is the information history. So I'm going to lay let IT be the information and that is at time t, what all information I have accrued? So I have accrued j0, oh, sorry, my time starts from 1. So j1, xj11, then j2, then xj22, and so on. jt minus 1, xjt minus 1, t minus 1. So that's the information I have accrued, and my policy has to make use of it of the, that information. So mu t should map i t to which arm I should pick at that particular time. That's my policy. So let's come up with, so one of the policy that was discussed in the class is 
I am going to go to each store five times, okay? And then I'll pick whatever is the best for me. Uh, so inspired by that, that let me come up with a policy. So a policy is mu t equals to t over n. So this is the ceiling function. So this is a very stupid policy, which is time step one, I'll go to store number one. Time step two, I'll go to store number two. Time step three, I'll go to store number three. Time step four, I will again go to store number one, and so on and so forth. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, that's my policy. Okay, just rotate among those stores. What's going to be my regret? Regret of this policy mu at time t. The regret would be I equal, so what is ti of t here in this case? So at the end of time period t, how many times have I visited store i? No? Come on, that's an easy question. So if I go to store 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, at the end of time period capital T, how many times have I visited store i? T over n approximately, T over n. So this is delta i T over n. i equals 1 to n. That's my expected regret. And this regret grows linearly with T. So this is equal to t summation delta i over n, i equals 1 to n. So this is linear in capital T. Yeah. Should that be mod instead of ceiling? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right, it's not ceiling. Uh, how should I write it? Mod, no. T, T mod n. Yeah, that, that, that's better, yeah, T mod n. So if I use a stupid policy that doesn't make use of any of the information that I've acquired so far, I get a regret that grows linear, that grows linearly in T. So that's not a good policy. Okay, I want to make use of the information that I've acquired over the past T time steps. Yeah. So from the argument about how regret will grow with respect to T, it looks like it should be something that since we don't know what M star is, we can prove that uh, the regret will have to go to infinity as t goes to infinity. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. So in this case, regret goes to infinity as t goes to infinity, but the important thing is how does the regret grow with t? And in this case, it grows linearly with t. So what would be a good growth rate for regret? So regret is going to infinity, but what is a good growth rate for regret? 1 over t, <laughs> that's very aggressive. 1 over t factorial, no. Uh, so let's try to think about it. What's a good uh, growth rate for regret? Any other thoughts? Logarith, who, who said logarithm? You're forbidden from speaking in this class. Well, yes, log logarithm is good, but that's not the only possibility. What about logarithm of t square? Is that bad? Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so uh, we would ideally like 
ideally we prefer that t raised to a limit t goes to infinity is equal to 0 for every a greater than 0. So, no matter what a you pick, so t raised to 0 0.01, we would ideally like the regret as t goes to infinity, we want the regret over t raised to 0 0.01 to be close to 0, okay? No matter which a you pick, as long as it's greater than 0. So, this subsumes the following forms of regret. So, regret mu of t could be log t could be log t square, it could be log t, log log t and so on, log t raised to 100, okay. You can pick any of these regrets, they are all good regrets. They are good regrets because they, uh, they satisfy all this, this particular condition. we're saying we can't achieve the, the exponential or factorial regrets because from a pure asymptotic case, they are lower than that. Right, than that. right, so right. there's something provable that says we can't get there? Uh, or is it experimental? You know, it's not, so I wouldn't say it's provable. So his point is, why can't I make it t factorial, okay? Um, so, That's a very aggressive uh, decay rate and it turns out that we can't really, I'm trying to think if t raised to a is equal to t factorial or not. No, no, no. t factorial is t raised to capital T e raised to minus t. So that's definitely, uh, this one is definitely more benign in comparison to t factorial. But it turns out that there is something statistical about it because of which you cannot, up, you cannot achieve t factorial in the denominator. Okay, we'll, we'll get to it in a bit. Okay, so ideally we want a regret that doesn't grow as fast as t raised to a for any a greater than zero. And the reason why this regret is uh, good is because if you look at the average regret, your average regret will go to zero very quickly. So your transient is very good, okay? Your average regret goes to zero and your transient, which means that the cost you have paid for the fact that you don't know what theta 1 all the way to theta n is, the cost is very small in comparison to the number of time steps that you have acted upon. Okay. Now there are two questions that we want to answer. The first question we want to answer is, What's a lower bound? What's an asymptotic lower bound on the regret? That's question number one. Question number two is, can we achieve the asymptotic lower bound on the regret? Okay. So two questions. Question one is, regret at time t under policy mu is greater than equal to what for all mu? So no matter which policy mu you pick, what's the asymptotic lower bound on the regret? And the second question we would like to answer is, a mu that achieves, or mu star that achieves the lower bound.
I want you to think about these two questions for a, for a little bit. So you have to think why these questions are important. Why is the first question important to answer? It's, it's a lower bound on the regret. Uh, upper bound for reward. Like upper bound for reward, yes. So because you don't know something, what's the maximum you can achieve? Okay, because of your lack of knowledge. So a lower bound on the regret allows you to quantify that quantity. So because you don't know how much are you paying for it, what's the minimum that you have to pay for it in order to uh, know the fact for sure eventually? So that's question number one. Question number two is, now that you know a lower bound that you can potentially achieve, uh, is there a policy that achieves that particular lower bound? Now these two questions, uh, I'm sure somebody would have asked it before 1985, I just don't know. But these two questions have defined the field of reinforcement learning for a very, very long time now, ever since 1985 if you ask me. So for every reinforcement learning algorithm, so this is a reinforcement learning algorithm because you have to pick a policy which uses the information to figure out what's the best thing to do in a situation is. And over a period of time, everyone has focused on these two problems. What's the lowest, what's the achievable, so what's the best performance you can get What's the lower bound on the performance you can get no matter what your learning algorithm is? So this is your learning algorithm. Mu is your learning algorithm. So what's the lower bound on the performance that you can get from your learning algorithm? And then the second question that people would try to answer is, how do you achieve that particular lower bound on the regret? Okay, so that's why these two questions have become important. I mean, these two questions are important and no matter which field of machine learning or reinforcement learning you are interested in, these are the two questions that you will always have to answer in your research. Or if you don't answer in your research, you will be perhaps unhappy about it because you don't know whether you have done the best you can or not. Okay, so now you are going to talk about the theorem that Lie and Robbins proved and they answered both these questions in, the, in their 1985 paper. Uh, so we'll, we'll discuss that in the rest of this class. So before I get to their theorem, I need to introduce KL divergence. So theta theta prime is given by integral log of f x theta over f x theta prime So we make the first assumption so some sort of regularity on theta so if m theta is less than m theta prime then 0 dkl theta theta prime less than infinity. So your KL divergence cannot become infinity if your means uh, of the two distributions are different.
So m theta converges to m theta prime. This should imply that dkl lambda comma theta should converge to theta prime. And the third m theta, theta n theta is an interval, open interval, I guess. Okay, let's try and uh, pass through these assumptions. So KL divergence is a very uh, natural notion of distance. Well, it's not a distance, but it's still used as a distance between two probability distributions. Uh, it's been used heavily in statistics as well as information theory. So some of you who might have taken an information theory course would have seen the KL divergence earlier. So this Anyone knows what a divergence is? It's like a metric, but it doesn't satisfy symmetry and um, triangle inequality. Okay, so that's the that's the mathematical definition of a divergence. Okay, so it doesn't satisfy triangle inequality and it doesn't satisfy symmetry. So nonetheless, uh, this is the KL this is the expression for the KL divergence. Um, the first thing says that if you pick two different theta and theta prime, their KL divergence should not be infinity. So you can't have a situation where one of the theta is, for instance, a Gaussian distribution, and the other theta is exponential with a different mean, uh, but their KL divergence would be infinity. So you want your set of uncertainty to be from similar distributions, not from very different distributions, so the KL divergence should not go to infinity. Isn't that also equivalent to saying that they should be supported over the same interval, because that's uh, where we, we would so get the infinite KL divergence? That is, uh, that is slightly more, uh, so the reason is all we need, so this is the minimal assumption we need, we want the KL divergence to be less than infinity, and if the means are different, then we want the KL divergence to be strictly positive. Okay. okay? Uh, what you are saying requires more structure. Uh, you are adding more structure to the problem, which is not really needed for the proof to work. Okay. So this is the first assumption. The second assumption is, uh, if you pick three different distributions, lambda, theta, and theta prime, and you let m theta go to m theta prime, then your KL divergence between lambda and theta should converge to the KL divergence between lambda and theta prime. So some sort of regularity condition is needed, some sort of continuity condition is needed uh, in order for the proof to work. And the third one is m theta should be an interval. So it's, uh, the actual condition is slightly more technical, but I don't want to introduce that actual condition. So this basically says um, you can, uh, the mean of the unknown reward should be within an interval 0 to 1, 0 to 5, 5 to 100, 100 to 1000, doesn't matter, but it should be an interval. Yeah. 
Okay. So what's their result? Their result is as follows. If mu is a policy such that limit t goes to infinity <coughs> so a policy that gives you a regret that satisfies the ideal conditions ideal uh, uh, yeah ideal condition then Lim inf capital T goes to infinity, regret mu t over log t is greater than or equal to summation of delta j over i theta j not i dkl. delta j positive. Yeah, so this one will become infinity or maybe zero if you allow delta j to be equal to zero. Oh, so it's exactly Yeah, because theta star will be equal to theta j in that case. So you just want to avoid that possibility. Uh, the summation is for the whole thing. Okay, so the difference in the means over the DKL between theta j and theta star, which is the optimal one. And this is all j such that delta j is greater than 0. Okay, so all non optimal j. Assumption of power distribution. No assumption except for those, that assumption. It's very much possible. As long as the KL divergence satisfy, the KL divergences satisfy all these conditions. Okay. Any other question? So what do we know from this theorem? No matter what you do, okay, no matter what you do, as long as your policy satisfies this uh, benign condition, okay, so we would like, ideally like the regret to decay uh, at a rate of faster than t raised to alpha, t raised to a for any a greater than zero. So as long as a policy satisfies this condition, which we would like an ideal policy to satisfy, the regret that you are going to accrue will be some constant multiplied by log t. Okay? So your regret will be at least that much. You cannot do anything better than that. It tells you the fundamental lower bound for your learning algorithm. This is, this is same as saying my regret of mu at t will be approximately some constant times log t and I cannot improve, cannot 
cannot be better for any other learning algorithm. This is the limits to learning. Okay, yeah. So, uh, is that uh, specific to regret minimization, or can we pose all other problems in such a way to make them a regret minimization where this bound holds? Uh, so no matter, so this is specific to regret minimization for multi-arm bandit, mm -hmm. <coughs> but you will see similar uh, bounds appearing even for the case of reinforced, general reinforcement learning, which we will talk about in a few classes from now. Okay. Um, and the most important thing is no matter what kind of uh, reinforcement learning problem you pick, uh, this is a bound that you cannot violate no matter what. So you will almost always have to pay a cost of log t in order to act well in a reinforcement learning setting. Okay. So let me give you an outline of the proof. I want to give you a very quick outline, the assumptions. So assumptions one, two, three imply the following for every epsilon greater than 0 theta not equal to theta star limit capital T goes to infinity probability oh theta j not equal to theta star probability of tjt greater than equal to 1 minus epsilon of t over which is which would imply that expected value of tjt over log t would converse to 1 over theta j theta star. Actually, I should have a greater than equal to here. So let me limit t goes to infinity greater than equal to. So for every epsilon greater than 0, you have to pick a non-optimal arm, at least log t over this divergence, KL divergence, uh, at least with probability 1, uh, you have to pick the non-optimal arm at least this, these many times uh, until time t, until time capital T. Okay. The proof of this particular result is very complicated. So this is where all the complications lie. But once you are done with this proof, this part follows immediately because uh, this is an event with probability 1 as t goes to infinity. So therefore, the expected value must also satisfy this inequality. And then you uh, 
apply this expected value in the expression for regret. So you have this delta j and then this 1 over dkl comes from this particular expression. Okay. So the regret mu at t is summation delta j expected value of sorry delta i expected value of t i t i equals 1 to n. Now the question is, now we have to talk about the second question which is how do I achieve this particular regret? What sort of policy should I pick? What should I poli policy mu should I pick so that I can achieve this particular lower bound that they have derived? Any, any question so far? Okay, so when you come to Columbus, when you first came to Columbus, if you had followed the optimal strategy, this is the regret you might have accrued so far in terms of your shopping experience. So let's think about uh, let's think about how to achieve the bound. What would you do to achieve the bound? So I told you that you came to the city of Columbus. This is the fundamental lower bound on the regret. Okay, you can't do better than that. So, so let's see what you have observed. So this is time one, two, three. 4, 5, 6, this is j of t that you might have picked, so arm 1, arm 5, arm 6, arm 2, 3, 4 and so on and then you are getting the reward, the reward will be 3.5, dollar 4, dollar 6, dollar 1, dollar uh, $3.2 and so on. Yeah. So the way I would start to structure it is, is at the start we're going to need some exploration phase where we're right. going to build estimates of the distributions for the yes. arms. Yes. Arms. And then I think that as we start with some initial epic length where, where the once we pass the exploration phase, we do what maximizes our expectation based off the estimates for the rest of uh, that phase, and then and we have a new phase, phase right. where we either have to make the phase longer or explore less, as, right. as, and we continuously update the estimates. Right. I'm thinking we're going to wind up making the epics longer, mm -hmm. but we're going to want something that's dual to the vanishing step sum. <laughs> Okay. So that the exploration time is infinite but decays over time. Right, right. That's great. So the idea is that you divide this whole time period into epochs, epochs of perhaps varying length, uh, increasing length. And in the initial phase, you just explore the estimate of what the reward you're going to get is. So how do you estimate the reward? So let's say I picked arm one. 20 times in the first 100 time steps, so arm 1, and I get the reward uh, $5, $7, $1, $3, $4. Okay, so these are the five rewards that I have seen uh, up to 100 time steps. So I have acted 100 time steps, uh, I picked arm 1 only 5 times in the 100 time steps and these are the rewards that I have seen. So what should my estimate for reward for arm 1 be? What would my estimate be? What's the average reward from this particular arm? Just take the average of this observation. So let's say the average m hat 100 or actually m hat 1 at 100 is uh, 
how do I add it up? Okay, I, I think I can add it up. 5 plus 7 plus 1 plus 3 plus 4 over 5. And that's, uh, oh my god. <laughs> 12, 13, uh, 16. Oh, wow. Uh, that, that, that's great. Okay, so this is 4. Average is 4. Okay, and I can do the same thing for all the other arms. Uh, I can find out what the empirical mean. So this is the empirical mean. So I have looked at the data from the past. I figure out what the empirical mean is. I do this for all the arms. And then I have a choice. I can either pick an arm with the highest empirical mean and get more rewards from there. Or I pick an arm with an inferior mean in order to explore more, okay? In order to explore whether this particular arm is really bad or is it just that I've seen bad outcomes so far, okay? And that's the fundamental trade-off in reinforcement learning, which is exploration versus exploitation trade-off. So I have, I have some knowledge at the time step 100. I have some knowledge, so this is arm one. I can do this for arm two, maybe dollar five. I can do this for arm three, dollar four point two five, and so on. Okay, I have, I have all these estimates, and now the question is: at at time hundred, I have to figure out which arm to pick, and I can either pick this arm because it's the most promising arm that I've seen so far, or I could potentially pick this arm because I've only picked it five times. I perhaps am not sure whether this is really the true mean or it's just the bad outcomes that I've seen so far, okay? So exploration versus exploitation. Either I exploit my knowledge or I explore an inferior option. At least it looks inferior to me at this point of time, but perhaps it's superior in long run. I just don't know. Yeah? What do you mean by bad outcome in terms of the Kroger example? Uh, so maybe you went to Kroger five times out of 100 and you just found that the vegetables were bad. Okay, so your reward is lower. Uh, maybe you went to Whole Foods 70 times and you found that the vegetables are always good or produce is always good or things are always tasting much better. So you have a higher reward for Whole Foods in comparison to Kroger. But it could be that you just went there on five bad weeks when there was a lot of hailstorm or heavy snow or whatever and they didn't get good produce that particular week. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, trade-off that we are trying to make. Okay. So now the question is, now here is the question. You know these numbers, okay? You know these numbers. How will you make a decision between whether to pick arm one or whether to pick arm two? So think about it. What would be a good way to make that decision? What would be a structured way to make that decision? So let me write down. Uh, I have picked five times. So T1, T equal to five. T2, capital T equals to 70. T3, capital T equals to 25, yeah. Yeah. So, so <coughs> assuming we're not going into just another exploration phase, it would just be a, the R max of the empirical means for whatever index gave you, you right. know, the highest empirical mean, and you'd be recalculating the empirical mean yeah. every time you got new data. Right, but it looks like if you continue picking this arm again and again, um, you might get a lot more data here, but you will get very few data points here, and you will get fewer data points here. That was my point about so long as you're in the same phase, I would artificially impose okay. some structure where we had 
Uh, Understood. Yeah. So you want to have phases, and within a phase, you want to exploit the information you have, mm -hmm. and in the next phase comes, you will start exploring, and then you will start exploiting that information. Yes. All right. Understood. So that's one way to do it, and it will yield some regret. Uh, I don't quite know whether it will achieve the logarithmic regret that we are interested in or not, but definitely that's a good strategy. Uh, in fact, I'll perhaps cover that particular strategy in the next class. Okay, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm just giving you example, okay? So let, let's just make it dollar five. Okay, so you don't get confused. All right, uh, I'm making up these numbers. <coughs> any uh, any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? So this is the arm that I've explored very little. This is the arm that I've explored a lot, and I need to figure out which of the arms I should pick. Okay, yeah. Good. So he's saying that since I have not explored this arm a lot, there is perhaps a lot of variance in my, uh, in my estimate of the mean. Okay, so I have a confidence interval, and I know that the mean is $4 at this point of time. The empirical mean is $4, but the confidence interval is somewhat large. So maybe um, I want to bump up this mean by a factor so that it accounts for my confidence on this particular estimate, okay? And that's the algorithm. It's called upper confidence bound. Upper confidence bound, UCB algorithm. That's exactly trying to bump up the mean of unexplored arms and let the mean of more explored arm stay where it is. Okay. So artificial, so I'm going to write it informally. Artificially bump up the mean of unexplored, unexplored or inferior arms. <coughs> That's the algorithm. Okay, how much to bump up it? Bump uh, bump up the mean by empirical mean by. Uh, let's let's talk about it now. Any question so far? Yeah. Yeah. So for the exploration. Right. You explore yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. There is no death anywhere in this. We're talking about rewards, not. <laughs> okay. So we define functions G capital T small t from R T to R. These are known as upper confidence bounds. So this one ingests all the data. So G. T T is a function of uh, let me call this. So I've used X J T for this notation. I'm going to use Y one one Y one two Y one three Y one four Y one five. Okay, or Y one. T one of capital T. So this acts on Y one T. No, Y one one to Y one. No, Y I one to Y I T, and it should satisfy. following
Yes. Yeah, so I'm this this small t is basically t i of t. Okay, so I don't want to write t i of t everywhere. Okay, that's the first condition we require on g t small t. The second condition is limit epsilon go to 0, lim sup capital T goes to infinity, summation T G capital T T y1 to yt greater than equal to mu lambda minus epsilon. over log t. I don't know how they came up with all these expressions, but they did. So lambda is any lambda in the in the theta, yeah, in the sp parameter space. Yeah, in that interval. Oh, mu. Sorry, 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 sorry. This is m. Mean. Mean m m. Where is m? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, what's the third condition? Third condition is gt plus 1t should be greater than equal to gtt for all t for all capital T. Okay, now what's the policy? I only have one minute, so we are racing against time. The policy is pick delta delta between 0 and 1 over n. Let j star t be given by arg max of m hat j given tjt is greater than equal to delta capital T and then the policy is mu t of i t uh, it is t mod n if m hat j star t is less than g uh, okay, let me let me write the policy in the next class because we are out of time. So I'll write down the policy in the next class. We'll pick it up from here.